Welcome, everybody, to the Law of Self-Defense show. I am, of course, attorney Andrew Branca for the Law of Self-Defense. And today we have some analysis of a use of force event out of Newton, Massachusetts. A man with strong feelings that the military actions of Israel and Gaza amount to genocide decides to charge across a busy street and tackle another man who's participating with others in a pro-Israel protest and the man who charges across the street ends up shot in the abdomen by the man he attacked. Now the shooter, Scott Hayes, has been charged with multiple felonies, and he's looking at 10 years in prison. The initial attacker who charged across the street and started this fight remains, to my knowledge, unidentified and uncharged with any crime. And presumably, Hayes will attempt to justify his shooting of this attacker as lawful self-defense. The question for us is, how viable is that defense? And how vulnerable is it to attack by the prosecution? That's what we'll be discussing today. And for those of you who stay to the end of today's show, and I certainly hope that's all of you, I'll let you know how you can pick up your own copy of The Law of Self-Defense Principles for free. This is our best-selling Handbook to how you can be hard to convict if you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property. Hang with us to the end. I'll explain how you can get a copy of that book for free. So Scott Hayes was participating with a few others in a pro-Israel protest in Newton, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston, when the group drew the ire of a man across the street wearing a pro-Palestine pin and objecting to what he characterized as Israel's genocide in Gaza. After a brief shouting match across the street, the apparently unarmed pro-Palestine man charges the pro-Israel group and tackles Scott Hayes, taking him to the ground. After a short bit of wrestling, a gunshot rings out and the pro-Palestine man takes a round to the abdomen, fired from the lawfully carried pistol in Scott Hayes' hand. Hayes has now been charged with the felonies of assault and battery with a deadly weapon and violation of a civil right causing injury, and each offense is good for 10 years in prison. Presumably, Scott Hayes will raise the legal defense of self-defense as a justification for the shooting, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts prosecutors will be obliged to disprove that claim of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt in order to secure a conviction on these felony charges. If they do disprove Hayes' claim of self-defense, his conviction, at least on the assault and battery charge, would seem a certainty. Based on the evidence we have in hand, including video of the attacks that we'll share with you, uh, how viable does a self-defense claim by Scott Hayes appear to be under Massachusetts' unusually strict law of self-defense? Conversely, how vulnerable does Hayes' claim of self-defense appear to be to disproof by prosecutors? Approaching an answer to those questions is what we'll be striving for today. So let's go ahead and jump in. Before I do that, I should mention today's show is sponsored by our longtime partner, CCW Safe, providers of legal service memberships. What many people mistakenly call self defense insurance. In effect, CCW Safe promises to pay their members legal expenses if the member is involved in a use of force event, like Scott Hayes is right now in Massachusetts. And CCW Safe does much more than that. I'm not saying Hayes is a member of CCW Safe. I have no idea about that. But CCW Safe does a lot more besides just pay its members' legal expenses. There are a number of companies out there that offer or purport to offer this kind of service. Some of them are worth considering, different flavors, best suit different people. Some of the other offers out there are hot garbage I can never recommend to anybody. CCW Safe is my personal choice. I'm a member of CCW Safe. My wife Emily is a member of CCW Safe. If you'd like to learn why they're the best fit for me, why I trust CCW Safe, you can point your browser to lawofselfdefense.com slash trust. There's a short video there where I, I explain exactly why they're the best fit for me and perhaps the best fit for you. And also there you can get a 10% discount code for when you also become a member of CCW Safe. Again, that's at lawofselfdefense.com slash trust. Okay, so I've stated out the basic facts of this use of force event already, so let's jump into the first video clip on hand, and that's the bit of shouting between the pro-Israel protesters and the pro-Palestine man across the street, and here is that video. You are sick. You are sick. Are you sick? <laughs> you are genocide. Genocide? Yes. But you are so stupid. 
Now that of course should have been how things ended right there with mere angry words rather than physical violence. But as it happens, the pro-Palestine man who's uh, against what he calls genocide chose violence. He chose violence by charging across the street at the pro-Israel group, tackling Scott Hayes and getting shot shortly after taking Hayes to the ground. Now, fair warning, the gunshot here can be heard on this video clip. Uh, and if you look super close, if you make an effort, you might be able to make out the actual gunshot wound. There's no blood or other gore, but if what I've just described is going to disturb you, uh, feel free to skip this video. This might not be the best choice for you. But let's go ahead and place the second video. This is where the gentleman actually charges across the street, tackles Scott Hayes to the ground, and gets shot for his troubles. <laughs> And finally, we have a third video clip from a slightly different angle uh, that I'll share with you as well. This one, you'll hear the gunshot within a, a second or two after the video starts. So it happens real quick, uh, but it gives us a slightly different perspective on what happens afterwards. Call the cops, of course. Call the cops. Why would we not call the cops? So now for any gun nerds in the audience, uh, it looks to me like Scott Hayes' pistol strongly resembles some variation of the Sig Sauer P365 pistol in 9mm. They only make those in nine millimeter with a, uh, a mini red dot sight mounted on top. They can come from the factory with the Sig Sauer Romeo X red dot on set on top for aiming purposes. Um, and why do I think this? It's a little hard to see. Uh, but when I look at this image, I grabbed off of that video. That's what I see. So here at top is the image I grabbed from the video. I've, I've inverted it. Um, and uh, flipped it and stuff so it is easier to make out. Uh, and at the bottom there is a image I took of a 365 uh, pistol uh, with a Romeo X red dot sight uh, right off the Sig Sauer website, a marketing image. So to the extent those look the same to you, well, they also look the same to me. Uh, so that's what I expect that Scott Hayes was carrying and used to shoot this gentleman who attacked him. As it happens, I'm pretty familiar with this particular model pistol setup as I frequently carry for personal protection my own. Six hour P365 XL with a mini red dot sight mounted on it. It's a great concealed carry package. I highly recommend it. Now, the model caliber and setup of this pistol doesn't matter for purposes of evaluating Scott Hayes' self-defense claim, of course. I just thought some of you might find the details of interest. As an aside, it appears from the available evidence that Hayes was in lawful possession of this pistol. He had a Massachusetts concealed carry permit. Uh, I'll mention, for those who don't know, that in Massachusetts, those permits are issued by your local police chief. Every little town has its own police chief. So it's not a statewide issue authority. The permits are good statewide, um, but they're issued by your local police chief, not some state-level agency. And they don't need to be terribly difficult to get. During the 25 years I lived in Massachusetts, uh, in Middlesex County, where this shooting occurred, um, and where Hayes lived, uh, I personally had a concealed carry permit the entire 25 years. Now, as a practical matter, the closer you live to Boston, the more difficult it is to get a concealed carry permit in Massachusetts. Um, just the nature of the police chiefs who do the issuing changes, and it is purely a May issue state at least when I lived there, it's at their discretion. Uh, where this shooting happened, Newton is right next to Boston. And I would not be surprised if a resident of Newton had some difficulty getting a concealed carry permit. Scott Hayes, though, lived in Framingham, which is well outside of Boston. So his possession of a valid Massachusetts concealed carry permit doesn't really surprise me. Now, <clears throat> Hayes has been charged with felonies, a violation of Massachusetts Section 15A, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. That's good for 10 years in prison. 
as well as Statute 37, civil rights violations, also good for 10 years in prison. Now, the assault and battery with a dangerous weapon charge is straightforward enough, right? Unless the shooting can be justified as self-defense, it would clearly qualify as exactly that crime, assault and battery with a deadly weapon. In fact, Hayes is lucky that he was not charged under Statute 15E, which is assault and battery by discharging a firearm, because then he'd be looking at 20 years in prison, not just 10 years in prison. Of course, that could change. The prosecutor could decide to add that Section 15E as an additional felony charge if they wanted to. The second felony charge against uh, Scott Hayes Statute 37, civil rights violations. I have to say, it doesn't really make sense to me on the facts of this case. If anything, the man who was shot was violating the civil rights of Scott Hayes by charging him and tackling him, apparently over political differences. There's no evidence to support the notion that Hayes' shooting of that guy was an act intended to interfere with the civil rights of the man who attacked Scott Hayes. The shooting may have been lawful self-defense or it may have been unlawful self-defense, but it hardly seems to be anything resembling a, a civil rights violation. In any case, the legal defense of self-defense that we're presuming Scott Hayes will raise as a justification for the shooting would, if successful, be a perfect legal defense to either of the felony charges against him. If it's self-defense, it's simply not a crime. So let's consider the relevant Massachusetts law of self-defense. But first, let's do kind of a 30,000-foot view of how self-defense law works generally. And of course, I'm referring to the five elements of self-defense. Self-defense law is pretty consistent across the United States. And there is a, this is a reflection of how old and well-established a body of law self-defense is. Uh, any claim of self-defense will consist of up to five legal elements. And for the claim of self-defense to be effective, every required element must be present. That means that if the prosecution can effectively attack even one of those required elements, the entire legal defense of self-defense collapses. For such an attack by a prosecutor to be effective, the prosecutor has to disprove any one or more of those required elements of self-defense and disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt to the satisfaction of the jury. If they do this, Whatever the use of force was, it was not lawful self-defense. And if a claim of self-defense is overcome, conviction is virtually certain. The very act of raising the defense of self-defense requires you to concede it was you who committed the use of force act. A defendant is not saying, I didn't shoot that guy and it was self-defense. That wouldn't make any sense. The defendant is saying, I did shoot that guy and it was self-defense. Well, if the self-defense claim is overcome, all that's left of that sentence is effectively a confession. If you're wondering what those five elements of self-defense claim are, you're in luck. I can share them with you. In fact, we have a totally free cheat sheet that we make available to anyone who might be interested. You can get this at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements, our five elements of self-defense law cheat sheet. It lists the five elements, provides a brief description of each. If you don't understand these five elements, you can't possibly understand self-defense law or defense of others law. So I urge you, it's free. It's just a PDF download. You can get your copy at lawselfdefense.com slash elements. So what are those elements? They are innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Now, in the context of a use of deadly force in self-defense, as here with Scott Hayes, these five elements distill down to the legal proposition that the use of deadly force in self-defense is legally justified if the defender was protecting himself against a reasonably perceived threat of unlawful, imminent, deadly force harm. And that will be precisely the question the jury will ultimately consider in this case. And the argument the prosecution already knows they will ultimately be required to win. That is, did the state successfully disprove beyond a reasonable doubt any one of the required elements of self-defense? If the jury believes it proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Scott Hayes was not protecting himself from unlawful, imminent, deadly force harm, then he doesn't have self-defense and he's easily convicted. To accomplish that win, the prosecution doesn't have to disprove Hayes' claim of self-defense in its entirety. It merely has to disprove any one of the required elements of self-defense. So to illustrate, prosecution here could effectively defeat Scott Hayes 
anticipated claim of deadly force self-defense if they can convince the jury that they have proven beyond a reasonable doubt any of the following propositions that are attacking elements of self-defense. In attacking the element of innocence, if the state proves that it was Hayes rather than the man he shot who was the initial unlawful aggressor in this confrontation. On the element of imminence, if the state can prove that the threat against Hayes, if any, was either in the past or in the speculative future rather than in progress or immediately about to occur. On the element of proportionality, the state wins if they can prove that Hayes was not presented with a threat readily capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury, the threat necessary to make his use of deadly defensive force a proportional defense to the threat. On the element of avoidance, the state wins if they can prove that Hayes could have avoided the need to use deadly defensive force by taking advantage of a completely safe avenue of retreat. And on the element of reasonableness, the state wins if they can prove that either Hayes himself lacked a subjective belief in the need to use deadly defensive force or that this belief, even if held, was objectively unreasonable. That is that a hypothetical, reasonable, and prudent person in Hayes' circumstances would not have shared that belief. If even a single one of those propositions can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt to the satisfaction of a jury, Hayes' claim of self-defense collapses and he's easily convicted at least of the assault and battery with a deadly weapon charge. Now, Massachusetts law in particular on self-defense is a little odd because they don't really have self-defense statutes like most states do, they, except for they have a castle doctrine statute, but that's about it. Instead, the Massachusetts law of self-defense is found in its case law, appellate court decisions. Um, and case law is as valid a form of law as any statute created by the legislature. And fortunately, we can avoid having to wade through dozens of Massachusetts appellate court decisions to get a general understanding of their law of self-defense because the essential principles have been captured within the state's relevant jury instruction, which is jury instruction number 9.260, self-defense. As is not uncommon, these jury instructions are rather sloppily crafted, and they too often conflate distinct elements of self-defense together into a single element. But now that we're informed on what to look for, we can readily spot the five elements of self-defense that I've already described within the jury instructions. So the instructions begin with an introduction informing the jury that it is not the burden of Hayes to prove self-defense, but rather the burden is on the prosecution to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. That's that yellow highlighted section right there on your screen. And if we skip past the non-deadly force part of the jury instructions to the deadly force part <clears throat> that's relevant to this case, we read, if the defendant used deadly force, which is force intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm, or used a dangerous weapon in a manner intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm, the Commonwealth, the prosecution, must prove one of the following three things beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, they say three things here. There's, there's really the five elements of self-defense, but as I said, they tend to conflate or combine distinct elements into their three things. It's just sloppy drafting. We'll see that in just a moment. But again, the prosecutors don't have to disprove the defendant's claim of self-defense in its entirety. If they disprove any one of the required elements, self-defense collapses. So what do the jury instructions tell us the prosecution has to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt to overcome Hayes' claim of self-defense with respect to his use of deadly defensive force? Well, it reads here first, that the defendant did not reasonably and actually believe that he was in immediate danger of great bodily harm or death. Well, if we know what we're looking for, we can spot here the kind of sloppily conflated distinct elements of reasonableness, that's the subjective and objective components of reasonableness, and the element of proportionality, right? Reasonably and actually believe is reasonableness, and proportionality is the reference to great bodily harm or death. So if the prosecution disproves either of those, the reasonableness of the belief or the proportionality, self-defense collapses. Alternatively, again, focused here on Hayes' use of deadly defensive force, the state wins if they can prove that the defendant did not do everything reasonable in the circumstances to avoid physical combat before resorting to force. And this is a reference, obviously, to the element of avoidance. If Hayes could have 
avoided the need to shoot by safely retreating, he'd have a legal duty to do so. And again, alternatively, another form of attack by the prosecution, the prosecution wins if they can prove that the defendant used more force to defend himself than was reasonably necessary in the circumstances. This is obviously a reference to the element of proportionality. Hayes could be justified in using deadly defensive force only if he were facing a proportional deadly force threat. The jury instruction then moves past to that to some other stuff. Um, that's also relevant to the facts of this case. Uh, it notes, for example, that here a person cannot lawfully act in self-defense unless he is attacked or is immediately about to be attacked. And again, this conflates two elements, the elements of innocence and imminence. The element of innocence, meaning the person claiming self-defense must have been the victim of someone else's aggression. They can't have been the aggressor themselves. And second on the element of imminence, that the threatened harm must be in progress or immediately about to occur, not in the past, and not speculatively in the future. We also see an additional emphasis on the element of avoidance with this duty to retreat language here. A person cannot lawfully act in self-defense unless he has exhausted all other reasonable alternatives before resorting to force. Now, I'll link to the full text of these jury instructions in the description of today's show. It's, uh, what, 23 pages long, um, and there's other good reading here. But for our purposes, uh, we've now covered what's necessary to do a productive analysis of Scott Hayes' likely claim of self-defense and its vulnerability to attack by the prosecution. And it should be pretty apparent now that the, the big element here that's really vulnerable is proportionality. Most of the elements of self-defense, four of the five, are pretty solidly in Scott Hayes' corner based on the evidence we have at hand. So the element of innocence. Well, it certainly appears that it was the man who was shot who was the initial physical aggressor in this confrontation, charging across the street in apparent rage and tackling Hayes to the ground. So the element of innocence appears solidly in Hayes' favor. With imminence, the attack against which Hayes was defending himself was actually in progress. It was not some past threat or some speculative future threat the element of imminence then appears solidly in Scott Hayes' favor. What about the element of avoidance? Well, given the rapidity of the charge and tackle on Hayes, it doesn't seem to me that there would have been a completely safe avenue of retreat that would have enabled him to avoid this attack. It was that quick. So I would conclude the element of avoidance is also solidly in Hayes' favor. And then reasonableness. I expect that Hayes had a genuine, good faith, subjective belief in the need to act in self-defense and that a reasonable and prudent person in his position would have shared that subjective belief. He certainly didn't imagine the attack. The element of reasonableness then also appears solidly in Hayes' favor. So that's four of the five elements of self-defense that appear solidly in Hayes' favor. But it's worth keeping in mind that the state does not need to disprove any particular element of self-defense. It only needs to disprove any one of them. I think they're unlikely to disprove those four elements beyond a reasonable doubt if they're dealing with a rational, unbiased, impartial jury. But there is that last one, that fifth element of self-defense, that element of proportionality that does appear vulnerable to attack. Now, I want to emphasize here before I get to this, because I see the comments on the internet, uh, Hayes was very apparently the innocent victim of an unlawful, imminent, actual attack by the man who charged across the street and tackled Hayes to the ground. And Hayes was absolutely privileged to act in self-defense against that attack. But it would appear on these facts that this privilege of self-defense against what appears to be a non-deadly force attack would be limited to Hayes' use of non-deadly defensive force, using his own hands, using pepper spray, something along those lines. Once Hayes resorted to deadly defensive force against an apparently non-deadly force attack, he exceeded his privilege of self-defense. He was no longer proportionally defending himself and therefore, he has no self-defense justification for that fired shot. The element of proportionality holds that you generally cannot use deadly defensive force unless you are facing a deadly force threat. 
Now, there are some exceptions to this general rule, typically involving the context of highly defensible property like your home, but, but they don't apply here. So for Hayes' use of deadly defensive force, which means not just force that can kill, but force that can cause serious bodily injury, which obviously the bullet fired here into the attacker's abdomen clearly could, that Hayes' use of deadly defensive force can be justified only if he was facing a deadly force threat. Again, a threat readily capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury. Was this charge and tackle attack likely to inflict serious bodily injury? If not, then Hayes' deadly force defense would violate the element of proportionality, lose him the justification and self-defense, and result in his easy conviction, at least on the assault and battery with a deadly weapon charge, and that's good for 10 years in prison. So let's look closer at this question of what constitutes a deadly force attack. There are a couple of ways that an attack might present as one likely to inflict death or serious bodily injury. Now, importantly, it doesn't mean an attack that could theoretically, possibly, a one in a million cases, cause death or serious bodily injury. It has to be one with a reasonable prospect of inflicting death or serious bodily injury. So what makes an attack a deadly force attack? Well, one way to look at it is the nature of the attack itself, right? An attack with deadly weapons, a gun, a knife, would clearly qualify as a deadly force attack. Even if an attacker is unarmed, an attack by a much stronger opponent, uh, or an attack by a number of opponents so that there's a disparity of numbers. Those could easily qualify as an attack readily capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury. And if so, attacks against which a deadly defensive force response would be appropriate. The other way to look at the attack is not so much the nature of the attack itself, but the nature of the person being attacked. In particular, if the person attacked has some exceptional vulnerability to injury that makes what would normally be a non-deadly attack into an attack that actually is readily capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury upon that exceptionally vulnerable victim. A thrown fist, for example, absent some aggravating factor like a great disparity in strength, a thrown fist is typically treated as a non-deadly attack. People can be killed by a thrown fist, but it's so rare that by default, the courts will treat a thrown fist, a single thrown fist, as a non-deadly force attack because it's not typically readily capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury. But if the intended victim is, say, on prescribed blood thinners, that thrown fist is readily capable of inflicting death or serious bodily injury on that particular victim because of their exceptional vulnerability to hemorrhage. So the same fist thrown that might not justify a deadly defensive force response when thrown against a healthy person could justify a deadly defensive force response when thrown against a person who is exceptionally vulnerable to injury. So circle back now, was this attack, this charging and tackling and pummeling of Hayes a deadly force attack? It certainly doesn't appear the attacker here was in possession of any weapons. I, I didn't see any when he charged and took Hayes to the ground. So there, there doesn't appear to be a weapons-based argument to support the notion that Hayes was subject to a deadly force attack. Nor does it appear that the attacker was much larger or stronger than Hayes. The attacker may have been younger, but actually appears physically smaller than Hayes. Plus, Hayes had friends immediately at hand who were able to, and in fact did, assist him against the lone attacker. So there doesn't appear to be a disparity of force argument to support the notion that Hayes was subject to a deadly force attack. Was Hayes exceptionally vulnerable to injury, such that being tackled to the ground and pummeled was reasonably capable of causing him serious bodily injury? Again, keep in mind, it's not enough that such injury could theoretically happen. It would have to be reasonably expected. Absent some exceptional vulnerability to harm on the part of Hayes, I think this would be a tough sell for the defense. This is particularly the case given that the attacker was alone and Hayes was accompanied by others who we can see on the video were quick to come to his defense. In my view, the prosecution here can make a pretty robust argument that this tackling and some looks like untrained pummeling 
was unlikely to cause Hayes death or serious bodily injury, especially with friends immediately at hand. And therefore, this attack was not sufficient to justify Hayes' use of deadly defensive force. Now, I want to engage in a little speculation. Uh, when I watch the video of this attack, there is a moment when Hayes is taken to the ground and just prior to the gunshot that I can hear some clattering type sound. Uh, you can listen for it yourself right here on this version of the video. It's about four seconds into this clip. Tell me if just before the shot, you hear some clattering type of sound. I'll play this video a couple times. It's short enough for that. Here we go. Again, I'll play it one more time. Okay, so <clears throat> now there are things that could have caused that clattering sound, right? They, these flagpoles here um, appear to be metal. Maybe they made the noise when they hit the ground, if they hit the ground. But I'm wondering if it's possible that Hayes' pistol fell out of his holster onto the ground when he was tackled. That wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility. And if that happened, it seems likely the pistol would be in plain view of the attacker and subject to being grabbed by whichever of these two guys was quickest. If that's what happened, and again, I can't see this on the video. I'm speculating based on that clattering sound. But if that's what happened, then what we really have here is a gunfight with two men battling over the gun. It's just like when Kyle Rittenhouse shot Joseph Rosenbaum, when Rosenbaum lunged for Kyle's rifle. And that shooting was determined to be lawful self-defense, appropriately enough. If Hayes had a reasonable perception that he was in a life and death struggle for control of his pistol, then his use of deadly defensive force could be legally justified. Presumably, if this is what actually occurred, we'll have evidence of this, either from further video or from witness statements. So I don't expect this to be ambiguous for long once people know what to look for. So Scott Hayes' self-defense does appear to be highly vulnerable on this element of proportionality. So other than those weird scenarios, some exceptional vulnerability to harm on the part of Hayes or a fight over a dropped pistol, uh, something along those lines, I'd be hard-pressed to see much difficulty to the state's likely argument that even if Hayes had the other elements of self-defense solidly in his favor, he was not faced with a deadly force threat and therefore could not be justified in his use of deadly defensive force, that he violated the element of proportionality and therefore lost the legal justification of self-defense. In which case, Hayes' conviction on at least the felony assault and battery charge with a deadly weapon uh, would seem pretty certain, and he'd be looking at a 10-year maximum prison sentence. All right, folks, I said at the beginning I would share with you how to get a free copy of our book, The Law of Self-Defense Principles, and now is the time for that. You can pick up this book for free at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. This is your handbook for how to be hard to convict if you're ever compelled to use force in defense of yourself, your family, your property. Check it out on Amazon, five-star rated, bestseller in its category, but don't buy it on Amazon. They'll charge you for the book plus shipping and handling. I think it's $20 or $25. We want to give you the book for free. We only ask you to cover the cost of shipping the book to you. The book itself is free, and you can get your copy at lawselfdefense.com slash free book. All right, folks, with all that done, I'll just remind all of you that if you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill, so your family is hard to kill, if you carry a knife, if you carry pepper spray, if you study jujitsu, I do all those things so that me and my family are hard to kill, then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law so you're hard to convict as well. Until next time, I remain attorney Andrew Branca for the Law of Self-Defense. Stay safe.